Christine, we can't see her, Miss Elliott. She's going to be on the audio only. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. I wanted to introduce our guests this morning, the Honorable Christine Elliott, Minister of Health, Deputy Premier and MPP for Newmarket Aurora is joining us, as well as Tony Van Bynen, MP for Newmarket Aurora. Leona Alislev is not here yet, but she'll be joining us. She's the MP for Aurora Oak Ridges and Richmond Hill. Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. I'm right here. You see your name on the list, sorry. Um, and Mayor Tom Arrakis is here. I know that Councillor Rachel Gilliland has joined us. I'm not sure if there are other councillors on the line, um, but I do believe there were a couple more joining us, Sandra Humphreys and John Gallo. Thank you all for joining us. I'm appreciative of the fact that you've taken time out of your busy days to be with us. And on behalf of the business community, I would like to thank all levels of government for all of the initiatives put in place for the citizens and businesses of Aurora. We know that you've all tried to respond quickly to rapidly changing environments, so thank you. Uh, we're going to have a slightly different format this morning because Minister Elliott can only be with us for a few minutes, so I'm going to turn it over to her for a provincial update and hope that we can have a few minutes um, after, and we'll have some questions later on after she leaves us. So, Minister Elliott, I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today. And I know that uh, these times have been very difficult and uncertain, especially for small businesses in Ontario. And I do want to assure you that we're doing everything that we can to support you and ensure that you're ready to safely reopen your doors when the emergency measures are lifted. We know that many of you are experiencing real financial pressures during the COVID-19 outbreak, and some of, some of you may be struggling to pay rent as a result. That's why we are partnering with the federal government to provide immediate support to our small businesses so you can quickly get back to work once it's safe to reopen Ontario's economy. Our government is committing $241 million to partner with the federal government to deliver more than $900 million in urgent relief to small businesses and their landlords through the new Ontario Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. This investment is part of Ontario's action plan, Responding to COVID-19, a $17 billion response package to provide support to people and businesses. The Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program will provide forgivable loans to eligible commercial property owners experiencing potential rent shortfalls because their small business tenants have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. To receive the loan, property owners will be required to reduce the rental costs of small business tenants between April and June by 75% and commit to pausing evictions for three months. Our government will continue to work with our partners to stop the spread of COVID-19 and also provide immediate support for people and jobs. I'm also pleased that because of the collective efforts of all 14 and a half million Ontarians to stay at home and stop the spread of COVID-19, we have dramatically reduced the number of cases in our province. Most importantly, together, we have saved lives. It's because of the determination and resolve of the people of Ontario that we are now able to consider moving into the next phase of our battle against this virus. But as we do, we must remember that the threat of COVID-19 is not over yet. Last week, our Jobs and Recovery Committee began developing a decision-making framework for the reopening of Ontario's economy. The reopening phase of our plan will happen in three stages. We're listening carefully to the advice of our health professionals and opening up in a responsible way, assessing progress for a two to four week period before going further. In each stage, there will be a natural progression in how workplaces, schools, and childcare settings, as well as other spaces can operate. Those that are at lower risk or that can immediately need public health guidance will open first. And as we continue to get the outbreak under control, we'll continue to ease restrictions. We will also provide very clear public health guidance so families, employees, and customers stay safe and healthy. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. David Williams, has outlined the criteria by which we will begin to slowly and safely ease public health measures and restart our economy. 
This includes, of course, fewer daily cases of COVID-19, ongoing health system capacity, ensuring public health units can contact new cases within the day, and continuing to expand testing to ensure effective surveillance in the community. To prepare for phase two, we will consult with Ontario businesses and organizations over the next few weeks. We want to work with employers to determine which low-risk workplaces could open and how they could adapt to public health and workplace safety guidelines when Ontario is ready. We want to hear from businesses and workers on how we can help make life easier for them during COVID-19. That's why we launched the COVID-19 Tackling the Barriers website to gather suggestions on regulations that are making it harder for business retool operations to produce health-related products and supplies, assist the healthcare system in meeting emergency needs, and of course, keep our supply chain and critical products moving. Our government will continue to work with businesses and other organizations to temporarily reduce the burden of regulations during the COVID-19 outbreak without compromising the health, safety, or the environment for Ontarians. With the innovation and creativity of Ontario people in business, this web tool will help improve our response to COVID-19 and jumpstart our economic recovery in the weeks and months ahead. I know that many people are worried about their businesses and jobs right now, with many people already having lost their job. Please know our government is doing everything we can to support you, but we may need to make sure that we get this right. We can't risk a secondary wave of COVID-19. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We have a clear path forward to safely and gradually ease restrictions. But to meet these criteria and begin to move forward, we need everyone to please continue their extraordinary efforts to stay home. Your determination and resolve have been nothing short of remarkable. Together, we will defeat this virus. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Um, will you be uh, leaving us now or are you, will you be staying for a bit? Unfortunately, I do need to leave now. I have to uh, join another meeting, but thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join you today. And I hope that the rest of your meeting goes well. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attending. And I just realized that uh, Michael Parsa is with us as well, MPP for Aurora New Market, Aurora Oak Ridge is in Richmond Hill, and also the parliamentary assistant to the president of the Treasury Board. So welcome, Michael. Um, okay, so I'm going to, um, Minister Elliott pretty much summed up some of the uh, things that have happened this week. I just wanted to turn it over to uh, MP Van Bynen if he had an update from the federal government for us. And I'll unmute you. There you go. Unmute you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I think virtually everybody on the chamber is uh, signs on to uh, the CBC at 11:15 every day, uh, and discover some of the new programs that have, that are being announced as the prime minister announced them. I get some of the details the following morning, as early as uh, seven seven oh one. Uh, the latest uh, announcements and uh, what's been approved by Parliament yesterday is a very substantial increase to post-secondary students. I think there's a uh, $9 billion plan to uh, support post-secondary students. That includes the Canada Student Benefit Plan, the Canada Student Service Grants, and uh, an additional 76,000 jobs that would enhance, that would uh, be made available through the Canada Service Corps. Uh, and there are some enhancements to the Canada Student Loans Program. That's been the primary focus in addition to uh, uh, the rollout of the uh, the rental uh, the rental uh, uh, support that was uh, just recently announced. Again, I just want to uh, reiterate how important it has been and how effective it has been in uh, all levels of government working together, and that includes the municipal, the uh, provincial, the federal, and even the regional programs. Uh, there is a, a lot of information on the programs that are available uh, through each one of the sites, and I think. Probably the biggest challenge these days is to simplify these sites because there is so much information. Uh, and so, uh, Sandra, the, the Chamber's been doing an excellent job in providing that information. Um, my office is available, although we're not uh, uh, doing uh, direct interviews in the office. 
via email, and that is tony.vanbynum at parl.gc.ca. Uh, and uh, so there are a number of a number of challenges that we've that we've seen, some of which I think focus a lot around the micro or the, the small small businesses, which seems to be experiencing some challenges in terms of qualifying for the CERB. And uh, Peter Vinen, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. You're cutting in and out. Um, I'm using I'm using a government computer today, so I'm not sure that, and, and I don't have a headset for that one, but. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so all in, I think where the major challenges are, are with respect to the, the micro, micro, the small, the sole proprietors. And that is part of an ongoing discussion um, at, the, uh, at the federal level. And we anticipate we might hear more, uh, but finding qualifications that, so that we catch most people, we know that we're not going to be able to catch all people, but that we catch most people in, in the safety net that we're trying to build. Okay. Um, would anyone else like to make some opening remarks? MPP Parsa, MP Alislav, Mayor Maracas? No? Move on to questions. Let me try this. Okay. Okay, so I had a few questions that came in via email yesterday. Actually, I had five questions. So maybe we'll start there. And then if anybody else has a question, if you maybe want to type it into the chat and I'll be watching the chat and just to moderate from there, just because there are so many people on the line, if I start unmuting everybody, it'll be very noisy. Um, so the first question I had is for the rent relief program, how will it be administered and what is the process? Can you benefit if you own the building in a holding company and charge rent to the business? Would someone like to handle that question? Tony, you're muted. I'm just going to unmute you. Tony, yep, there you go. The thing that I can offer at this point is that it's being administered by the CMHC, and the approach will be to the landlords, and the landlord will require um, um, an undertaking uh, with a tenant, uh, and that would require the landlord to ensure that that. Uh, that uh, the savings for the landlord or the, the loans to the landlord are passed on to the tenant. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any of the applications. I haven't had any feedback on the applications at this point as yet, um, but I don't know if maybe some of your members might have approached their landlord and I'd be interested in hearing what the success has been there. Well, I can actually comment on that. I had about five or six calls yesterday uh, about <laughs> topic um, that the landlords were saying and of course you only hear about the negative you don't usually hear about the positive but uh, that the landlords were saying that they either didn't qualify or that they wouldn't be applying for the loan and we've heard also from a number of tenants to the same effect so I'm not exactly sure why uh, that is and that's why we're we're asking the government but there's any number of landlords that are choosing not to use this program um, because they don't feel that it 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 is secure enough or benefits them enough and so we're having uh, tenants who are saying that they're quite concerned about that so i think uh, understanding if anyone else is hearing that and getting that kind of information uh, gives us a good opportunity to make sure that we understand why this program isn't perhaps working the way we thought it was going to uh, from the outset. Sandra, if you don't mind, I'm just going to add something to that. Uh, both of my uh, colleagues at the federal level have both uh, covered uh, what it what we know so far. But the one uh, the one additional information that uh, that I think I've heard and that uh, my federal colleagues can probably confirm is that the um, the uh, hesitation on the on the landlord's part was the fact that they had to. Uh, disclose uh, the this the the seventy five percent would have come from the profit portion as it was uh, set from the beginning. It was on the profit portion of the rent. Uh, from my understanding, that's not going to be the case going forward. It will be on the gross amount, um, and that's going to be announced soon uh, by the by the federal government. And I'm looking forward to that announcement because that would mean that uh, a lot of landlords. Uh, would take this up, and it, as a result, it would be passed on to the, to the tenants. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, so the next question I had was regarding 
daycare for essential service workers. We know that the men and women who choose funeral service careers are diligently caring for our hurting communities and are considered essential frontline workers. Yet the bereavement profession isn't included on your approved sector list to qualify for much needed daycare. Would someone like to comment on that? I guess, okay, sorry, go ahead, Tony. Tony, you're muted again. Yeah, yeah. Tony, we can't hear you, but you're not muted. Can't hear you. Not working. Not working better now, Sandra? Yeah, that's better, yeah. <laughs> Ever since we had this virtual parliament, we've been muted so often, right, Leona? <laughs> Anyway, uh, I believe, Michael, I think that's uh, the provincial lead, so I was going to pass it on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. I thought you were going to say something. So, yes, it was. And um, look, when, the, when, this, uh, when, when this started, uh, we looked at uh, capturing as much as, pe as much as we can under this program when, when the minister announced it, and that was essentially all the, uh, the frontline uh, service providers in the medical field. And then it was further expanded uh, to include those uh, that are in the uh, supply, food supply chain, uh, the retirement homes, grocery store, pharmacists, and uh, certain federal employees like in, in the military. Um, so the, uh, the, the program has been expanded. And, um, you know, uh, th this, is a, uh, a, this is for us to be able to capture as much as we can uh, under the program to those that are in the, on the front line providing service to the people. And, um, and I think the minister's done a great job capturing as many of those as possible. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, so the next question that I have is, why has the federal and provincial governments failed to recognize the private home care industry during the pandemic and the valuable role they play in keeping our vulnerable clients safe at home? Most of the wage benefits offered were for publicly funded healthcare workers only, which will make hiring qualified staff even more difficult when trying to compete with the wage differentials. Who would like to comment on that one? If you guys want, I can start off with that again, and, and my colleagues can take it on after that. But the uh, these are extraordinary times, and they're unprecedented. And we have taken all, every measure to make sure that we support uh, the people, especially the most vulnerable, uh, by offering as much uh, funding as possible. Uh, more funding was announced with partnership with, for example, organizations that would deliver food and medicine to our, to our seniors, uh, making sure that um, measures were put in places uh, at retirement homes, at long-term care homes, to make sure that uh, those vital services that they depend on are delivered to them in a timely way, as well as making sure that there's enough staff uh, to be able to, to serve everybody. Um, uh, this, these are unprecedented times, uh, and, and everybody uh, recognizes that. Uh, we're uh, doing the very best we can to make sure that we, we not only help and support uh, everyone, but in particular those that are vulnerable. And we've partnered with many organizations, for example, Meals on Wheels, for example, is one uh, that stepped up, as well as uh, uh, the many other organizations that have, through their volunteer program, have assist us, assisted us with uh, businesses to make sure that uh, the, the most vulnerable are supported during this critical time. Thank you. Would anybody like to add to that? Okay, then we'll add to the next question. Um, I, would like to I would like clarification on how many unrelated people can be in a car together, thinking of getting crews to a job site if you have social distancing in the vehicle because it has three rows of seats. Who would like to tackle that one? Again, that, I would see that as a provincial issue. So right now, uh, I would uh, be more than happy to take down as best as I can. So I tell you, right now, we're telling you, we're asking everyone to stay home until they absolutely have to. So un until the Chief Medical Officer of Health of Ontario changes that direction, uh, we asked 
let the people to please stay at home and go out only when you have to until those directions are changed. Uh, we've made some significant inroads thanks to all the great work that Ontarians are making. But I think those, um, those are subsequent uh, stages and phases that we're going to announce uh, where uh, when, as soon as the province starts opening up, uh, those will be announced later on. But for now, uh, people just need to stay at home unless they absolutely have to go out for essentials. Thank you. Will there be any programs provided at either the provincial or federal level that supports those small businesses who do not have employees but leverages independent contractors to do the work? Will there be any subsidy or tax relief provided for those types of working relationships? This is a, this is a point, uh, Sandra, that I've raised a number of times on our, on our national conference calls uh, every day all parties get together on a, a technical briefing. Uh, and my concern are around not recognizing contract employees, also commissioned employees as part of the, the wage calculations. Uh, and uh, I keep hearing that it's under consideration uh, and uh, we anticipate that we might hear more over the next week or so. Uh, uh, but at this point, I can only say that I've advanced the issue. I've advocated for consideration. Uh, because commissions is in part uh, uh, a wage payment that needs to be considered, so it's it's uh, it's being it's being reviewed, uh, and as soon as I hear something, I'd be be happy to send a note off to you there. Okay, thank you. So the next one is: Do the MPs and MPPs have a more immediate plan for rent relief and or aid for small businesses? Most businesses don't qualify for the loan and most landlords won't apply for the rent relief program. What, what are their immediate plans to save many of these businesses? We received a letter saying legislation hasn't been passed and therefore rent is due in full. This was two days ago. I'll defer, I defer to the province on that. That's a collaboration and the landlord-tenant landlord relationship, I think, is, is uh, managed by the, by the province. So once again, uh, Sandra, thank you, Tony. So once again, I think once the uh, the announcement is made, uh, I think the, a lot of landlords would be in a much better position to be able to uh, work because their hesitation from everything that I heard from constituents was that uh, the, they did not want to disclose the much, uh, too much information as far as their profitability of the building, et cetera. That was the uh, stumbling block. Once that is removed, I think that would um, ease that and more, there will be more uh, buy-ins on, on, on behalf of the landlords. As far as support for small businesses, I think um, that you have seen that governments of all levels um, have taken this on because we recognize the importance of small businesses and the contributions to our economies, uh, not, not, at, not at the province, but at the national, but at the local level, the, the work, the contributions that they make, we all recognize that. And um, there's, not, there's nothing that we won't look at. There's no program that we will not consider to make sure that the small businesses are supported. Um, right uh, once we are uh, out of these trying times because they are perhaps the most impacted and we will rely on the engines of the, of the economy to get back on their feet again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any opportunities that you feel have come from this challenge, progress that we have now achieved or can more quickly achieve due to the pandemic response? I'll, uh, I'll quickly answer that and I'll uh, pass it on to my colleagues. But I have to tell you, one of the things that, uh, that we were working on in, in our ministry prior to this was the centralization of, um, of government services. And, and I think that uh, we've seen now more than ever how important it is to be able to have a, a centralized uh, system where services are rendered uh, more readily and, and, and quickly uh, when needed knowing what what you have uh you, you the inventory the services and how quickly that you can deploy them uh to uh to areas that are needed so um that's during this uh pandemic that's something that we have seen at uh, front and center how important it is for us to be able to uh to to know that as a, as a government and i think all levels of government will be uh, looking at implementing such measures 
And whoever asked that question, uh, Sandra, is fantastic. Uh, I know everybody is, is worried and stressed and concerned about the immediate, and that's exactly where we need to be right now. But at the same time, in the back of our heads, with 2% of our additional energy and thinking, we need to be looking at that because we are going to come out of this, not evenly or equally, and the world really has changed. I doubt very much that we'll be able to go exactly back to the way it was on the beginning of March. So really we need to be, what this crisis has done is given us more information about our economy, things that we didn't really understand about how people pay people, how, where our supply chains actually are, where the interdependencies and interrelationships are uh, between federal and government, uh, federal and provincial, not even just jurisdictions, but in terms of programs and support uh, to those programs. So while we are focused on the immediate right now and making sure that people, that programs work the way they're supposed to and that people are getting the need that they need immediately, we do ask two things. One, around the reopening, what kinds of questions do you need to have answered or what kinds of things need to be in place for you to be able to open? I've heard from people around interprovincial trade barriers or interprovincial inter um, movement and different uh, quarantine things that are preventing some companies from having their supply chain open up. Do you need to understand more about like that question on transport? How many people can be in a truck and is that going to be the same if that truck is going across a, a provincial border? Will we be uh, opening, what about social distancing on trains and planes and does it make a difference to you as a company if a border in Ontario opens but not a, a, a US Canada border uh, in BC as an example. So those are just some of the things. What, what things do you need answered in order to be able to consider uh, reopening and will the subsidies and when they stop make a difference to what and how you can reopen? And then some of those longer term things uh, around uh, technology and having government services uh, on, a, on a phone or an app or infrastructure. So all those kinds uh, of things, if you can send it to MPP and, uh, and my office, leona.alislev at parl.gc.ca, that'll help us in this moment to start doing some of the thinking about the next couple of of stages. So thank you very much, Sandra, and whoever asked that question. Thank you. Anyone else? One of the things that I think we've learned is how vulnerable our supply chains are, particularly with uh, essential uh, uh, products. And, I, and, I, and it's uh, really amazing to see the way Canadian companies are responding in manufacturing the, uh, some of the PPEs. And I think those are, so some of those things are something we need to give a lot of consideration to. Um, I think the role of technology in the way we deliver services uh, continues to be emphasized. I don't know anybody who isn't meeting by Zoom anymore and uh, how, how uh, strong those kinds of networks will be. That speaks to another vulnerability that we have is if our electrical system and or if the internet system breaks down, then uh, I think that there's very significant exposure in terms of how we cope with not only doing business on an ongoing basis, but uh, being able to communicate uh, amongst, uh, amongst family. But, but our service delivery mechanisms, our retail delivery mechanisms will see substantive change. And when we start talking about getting back to normal, I think we should really consider what that normal is. Thank you. The next question I think is very easy to answer. Do charities qualify for rent relief? Uh, I believe they do. Um, uh, we've, we've seen that in the, uh, in the documentation. Are there any discussions about expanding wage subsidy programs? No, I'm not sure if that, if they're referring to expanding it to make it longer or, um, or what the, the actual question is, but. Um, she continues it, with her thought just down below. I'm sorry? There's a second part to her question just down below. As a small business? Sorry, Deb, do you want to step in? I don't see it. Yeah, it's, it's a new, I think, uh, asking about uh, the wage subsidy and then talking about. Yeah. 
Okay, as a small business, I, find, I am finding a number of my staff do not want to come back to work as they make more money with CERB because the wage subsidy, their income will be taxed. Are there any discussions to review CERB and wage subsidy? At this, I think that question, uh, Sandra, was raised um, during, during the debates yesterday. And I think that there were some amendments that were proposed that were adopted. Um, I think people also need to consider that this is a temporary measure uh, and uh, that uh, this measure, as soon as we get the economy back up and running, will not be available. And that needs to be a consideration. I believe the, uh, the amendment to the bill was that there was a requirement for people who are applying for CERB to also apply to have their name in on a job application process. Uh, Leona, that's correct, isn't it? Um, my understanding is that's a condition for the student, not uh, for the not CERB. Right, so right. The, 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 the key element, I think, with the CERB is that you can earn an additional a up to $1,000. So you can get the CERB and still earn up to another $1,000. And so I think that that is uh, part of the hope to encourage people uh, to go back to work. Uh, and so I think, uh, but we're still pushing, uh, obviously, to, to encourage people to make the transition and go back to work uh, as the CERB is only a temporary program. I think what I've heard from several businesses is that part of the struggle is that they don't know what to do when they say they don't want to come back because CERB is paying more. Are they at liberty to hire someone else? Uh, is, is the employee virtually terminating themselves by saying they're not coming back? So there are some questions around that because um, with the Emergency Act, jobs are secure provided they have to take care of someone or they have a reason for not being able to go back. So I think that's what businesses are struggling with and some of the small ones are really struggling with this because they're trying to get their businesses back up um, because they are essential services and can't get people to come into work. So we'll move on to the next one. No mention, there's been no mention of an extension or a deferral of some sort for the HST payment. Is This is another critical financial aspect for small business. So I can uh, quickly tell you about the provincial. That's one of the early on, very first thing that we announced uh, in our uh, budget in, 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 at the end of March, where uh, we, we looked at businesses and cash flow being uh, you know, a big factor when you're running a small businesses, which is why uh, we deferred uh, essentially all um, most of uh, provincial taxes for six months so that that cash flow will remain with small businesses. And that's at the provincial level. Okay, thank you. Um, if you uh, small business buying experience have an exemption. No. Okay. What exactly will trigger trigger the opening of businesses? I think we just spoke about that a little bit. While all levels of government are starting to plan the complex stages of opening the economy, how will all three levels of government ensure that all businesses receive a clear, coordinated message of who can open, when they can open, as well as the consistency? in the preventative measures to be taken to minimize confusion, as well as another potential outbreak while respecting local needs and differences. I think this, um, this is a challenge from the federal government's point of view. What we need to do is to recognize that the circumstances are very different pro province to province and in many cases, municipality to municipality. Uh, and, uh, and so the consideration that the provincial government is putting forward uh, uh, is all within the framework that's been agreed to amongst the Premier and the, and the Prime Minister. Uh, and the implementation, I think, is more in the hands of the province. And so I would defer to uh, Michael. No, you're absolutely right. And um, but back to what we discussed earlier, this being uh, obviously the, the three phases that, that the, the Premier announced a couple of days ago. And that, uh, but we want to make sure that when we're going to be opening up the province, when we're ready, when the chief, uh, when the chief medical officer of health gives us the green light and gives us uh, a, a position that we are in fact ready to move in that direction, because we have all done a, uh, we've done a lot in the last six weeks to get where we are today. And even though the numbers are starting to look um, favorable towards that direction, we still have to make sure this is done prudently and in a way where we do not um, hurt uh, the chances of, of all the good things that we've done the last few weeks. 
um, having said that, there will be a, a phase that uh, we will be consulting with uh, an actual committee was created by the premier led by the finance minister. That's the, uh, the recovery phase that will be leading the recovery phase. And part of that will involve uh, consulting with uh, business owners and, and, the, and the people of Ontario to see what we're going to be opening, what at what stage, and it will be done uh, in uh, in windows of two to four weeks, so that uh, the chief medical officer of health, as well as his team, are able to analyze the numbers and um, whether perhaps to stay the course or move on to the next phase or even revert back to the to the to the uh, previous stage. So everything that will be done from here on will be done uh, with the with the consideration of. Uh, the health and safety of the of Ontarians, as well as prudent decision making on on what we do to to make sure that Ontario businesses are able to get back on their feet as quickly as possible. And if I could add just one small uh, um, part of that, that's what we're sort of focused on at the moment. But the thing is that there's a lot of things that I'm hearing from people where we are a global supply chain. So a um, small business in our riding is dependent on uh, goods that are coming from outside the country or are supporting a larger company that is also dependent on offices in other provinces. So while we do think that it is sort of a local one province um, aspect, there is an interdependency across the country and for goods that are coming in from outside of the country that are significantly impacting uh, businesses even here in Ontario or even small businesses with only a few employees. Thank you. Uh, what are the strategies for K-12 education and curriculum delivery? I know this is an ongoing discussion every day. Um, Harmonizing of transit regulations between provinces, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. So, sorry, Leona, you're cutting out. I can't. We're not able to hear you right now. So, Michael, do you have any news on this? Or it's made those decisions to open. I'm sorry, Sandra. I, I didn't hear you. What was that? Um, what are the strategies for K-12 education and curriculum mm -hmm. delivery? Yeah. Well, um, as you heard, the, the minister had, uh, we had to extend uh, the, uh, the deadline, the deadline, the uh, closure until uh, May 29th to, uh, to the end of May. Um, all of the uh, decisions that have been made, and once again, is as a direct, um, you know, instructions uh, by the chief medical officer of health. And um, the, the, the decision that was made to extend it to May 29th uh, was perhaps something that um, that the, the, the minister looked, it wasn't taken lightly. And um, all the, uh, it, to, to, to make sure that all the, all the programs, uh, all the courses will still continue on, make sure the school year is finished, was a concern uh, to, to the minister and, and our government. But we wanted to make sure that while they are at home, they are able to finish um, the year and uh, move, on, move, uh, move forward to uh, post-secondary school. Thank you. How do we afford to purchase PPE when reopening, but revenue has declined and there is not enough money to afford PPE? So this goes to the, the question of reopening and the measures that will be in place. <clears throat> I guess in, in, in part, um, you know, the, the, um, the $40,000 loan uh, is, is uh, designed to put some liquidity back into the, uh, the small businesses. Um, I think each uh, business needs to be uh, taking a look at uh, their, own, their own individual circumstances and there needs to be some planning for that. Um, will the, uh, the $40,000 loan be the only solution? No, there needs to be a number of uh, things that we need to consider, like the wage subsidy in part that's uh, intended to provide some liquidity. And there are some guaranteed loan options that would be available through the financial institutions. Uh, in terms of what we've learned uh, here, Sandra, is that relationships with our bankers and our landlords um, seem to be more critical at times like this. And I think it emphasizes uh, the importance of maintaining uh, a healthy relationship between those three significant business uh, stakeholders for every business as we go forward. Uh, so um, there, there may need to be additional programs. I guess we'll have to address that 
when we get to the point where we're phasing out and how we might approach that. So that needs to be a further consideration, but can't be too far off into the, into the future because we're hoping that we will be able to start opening up slowly as, as Michael has identified earlier. Okay. During the quarantine, artists and musicians have stepped up to help Canadians cope with isolation. Are there any plans to help the arts and culture community? We run music festivals in support of youth in music. There are, has been some announcements with the Minister of Heritage, but uh, you have another MP uh, on the south side of Aurora who's joined us. So I'm, let me turn that over to you, Leona, to, uh, to, to respond. Oh. oh, well, thank you very much. There's no question that, uh, that arts and musicians are a critical part of the fabric of our society. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're pushing for these venues to also um, be able to be taken into consideration in some of the support programs, because we know that we need to make sure that they are here at the end of the day too, so that we have all the elements of our, our economy. So we're, we're certainly pushing for it. And uh, we hope that the government will uh, take that into consideration. So, Senator, on top of the uh, providing the entertainment, uh, obviously, the, by musicians and entertainers, they're also a source of uh, revenue. Uh, uh, you know, part, a lot of these um, expos and and uh, and uh, concerts, for example, the smaller ones, uh, were attracting a lot of tourists to to our local communities, the province, and perhaps all over the country. And uh, the minister, uh, who's in charge in at our at our within our government, has had multiple town halls with the people in this sector to see how we can assist means of financial or uh, assistance uh, through um, our government to see how we can help to make sure that when we are open when we when we do re during the reopening stage and subsequent how our government can assist to make sure we're up and running again because they impact so much than just entertainment as i said their source of income as well um, to our tourism industry well, Sandra, the, the other thing too is that the, the government has announced a $500 million emergency support fund for cultural heritage and sports organizations. The details haven't been rolled out as yet, uh, but there is a commitment to provide that type of support, recognizing uh, you know, the, the importance of arts, culture, and sports in the economy, as Leona has said. Thank you. In order to have our workforce return, many have their children at home teaching them and caring for them, which, have put, which has put much stress on normal work days and returning full time to the workplace. Being that schools, childcare centers, camps and programs continue to be closed, are these factors being considered for the reopening plan? I'll start that off and I guess I'll pass it on to to, uh, to my colleagues, but yes, it is. So part of the reopening plan uh, will include looking at uh, every sector and and, uh, and in particular those that are going to be returning to work, how we can make sure that this transition is, is in a way that that is smooth for the for the people. Uh, it, it has, it has been a very trying time uh, for everyone. It's been a difficult period, but when we move on to, to our uh, three phases, we have to make sure, again, it will be done in consultation with sectors, with business owners and the people to make sure that it is done so in a, in a, in a smooth way. Thank you. Anyone else like to comment? I think throughout all of this, Sandra, how, how we approach the return back to uh, restoring the economy, uh, we need to be very, very careful that we balance that with the science and the health care. We've, we've, uh, we've come a long way and, uh, and I would hate to see uh, a number of weeks uh, turn us back into a, a, you know, a more restrictive uh, environment. And, and that's why you know, the, the, the checks and the science as we go forward are so critically important so it's good to see that that's part of the framework that the province and the feds have put together. I shouldn't say feds, that's me, isn't it? It's all levels of government. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So one of the conditions for businesses to obtain, a CBA, to obtain CBA funding is for the borrower to have an active business checking account. However, some of the business owners have chosen to operate through a personal account. Is this under review? Are we likely to see further changes to come to the qualification criteria for SIBA loans? This is, this is a, a very active discussion going on with the parliamentary tech, 
technical uh, uh, conference calls that we have every day. So uh, that, that point has been raised by all parties in all areas uh, and is said to be under active consideration. Thank you. If I could just add something to that, Sandra, the challenge there is that banks have much more fiduciary and regulatory responsibilities for business accounts than they do. We lost you again, Leona. Is that they want a business account is so that we can make sure that there's that that double check and regulatory so that the government is mitigating potential for fraud. So really, that's why there's uh, the two accounts, and that's the stumbling block in terms of resolving it around personal accounts. Okay. And then I have, there's three questions or comments, and they're all related to PPE, so I'll just read them out. Uh, perhaps having PPE expenses as a tax de deductible expense would help. Relying on loans and racking up debt is not ideal to purchase PPE with such unexpected drastic revenue loss. Please consider grants for this as debt will put us out of business. If PPE is going to be an integral part of returning to work, are there plans in place to ensure that supplies can meet demand and clarity on what standards are needed for the PPE? Those are all PPE related questions or comments. Would anyone like to comment on that? I think there's some great suggestions there and uh, certainly would be happy to bring that forward. Uh, it's, uh, it may be part of a solution. Senator, when, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, the, when, when we start um, getting, getting engaged uh, with our town halls, with our uh, local representatives, uh, having to go back to their constituents, as I mentioned to you, that was part of the, to the recovery phase that we announced. Is I would like to hear ideas like this that I can take back to our government. Uh, any idea that would help us. Um, business owners are very creative uh, individuals who come up with all kinds of ways uh, that would help uh, you know, governments of all levels. So suggestions like this, when, when we do get going, uh, which won't be long from now, would be great if you can uh, you know, solicit this from the members to make sure that they join and are part of that um, meeting so that I can take these back to the government. But there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, PPEs will be uh, part of the new normal as we get back to, uh, to our uh, daily lives. Okay, thank you. Um, and I do have another question that just came in. I know we're running a little late on time. Is everybody still okay to be on for a few more minutes? Mm -hmm. I apologize, Sandra. I do have to leave. I have a nine o'clock. Okay. All the best and thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, this is an invite with a question. Having created a game plat platform that engages an entire community of residents, town and merchants, I invite you to consider the potential and benefits of using the play at home scavenger hunt to expose your services like online shopping, take out to residents. Thank you. I sell a specific line of carpets, which is a big part of my overall business, and I understood they were not fulfilling our orders be based off of their services being considered non-essential. Communication from their president confirmed this. I realized that they were fulfilling and shipping to larger retailers, such as Wayfair Canada, so I called and questioned why they were given priority, and yet small businesses like mine were not, and yet we were the ones struggling. They tabled this further with someone more senior who decided to ship my order and have been fulfilling my order since. If I would not have raised this concern, I don't think anything would have been done, and yet they would have continued to fulfill orders with these larger retailers. I, I think that's more of a comment. Um, I don't like to hear that, but uh, I don't think any of us do. And what have we learned from other countries who have started to reopen the economy? Is there a successful model in terms of which parts of the economy opened first that we are looking at for guidance? And perhaps more importantly, what they did that didn't work outside of keeping people home to keep the curve down? Well, Sandra, I think uh, what we've seen is that there are, Canada is such a big country and there's such huge regional differences uh, that that the solutions need to be delivered on on a local basis, and uh, and, that, and I think that's key part of the consideration as to how we would approach that uh, for individual provinces. In some cases, uh, it might be different where large cities might need to take their own approaches as to how they would restrict uh, the recovery and how they would would uh, 
uh, rule that out. The one thing I think that we found is that there are so many levels of government. What's really critical is to get a channel that uh, enables us to align uh, the, the, the overall principles, but at the same time, recognize those local differences. That's so critical. Uh, but there needs to be a framework that I think there's more work to be done there. Uh, Senator, I think, I mean, to, just to add to, to Tony's point, she's absolutely right. I mean, there's, um, I think that uh, you should be looking at other jurisdictions, other countries, and and to take away some of the successes that they had and learn from some of the perhaps uh, not so successful initiatives and, and as far as uh, their opening. But, uh, it, you know, every jurisdiction is different. Um, you know, the, the, the entry into uh, the pandemic was different for uh, different provinces and different jurisdictions. So they will be, uh, there might be a, 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 a variance as far as when and how, but, um, you know, every, every, every jurisdiction and every province here in Canada will do everything they can uh, to, to better help and support their people here. And so will we here in Ontario. Thank you. Um, that's the end of the questions that I have that have been submitted. If anyone feels that they're that they have a question that they haven't had an opportunity to submit, I will unmute everyone now for for a moment and give everybody an opportunity. The, the one thing that I think we found, uh, Sandra, is that uh, we're so reliant on technology. And uh, what we what we need to do, I think, is to give some thought about creating a more robust and scalable internet system. I think that would really be key. I think a lot of our business uh, and our business would agree with that. On broadband and its uh, its availability throughout, I think, is 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 a huge issue now that everybody's working from home. I apologize. No. If any more questions from the sports industry? I'm going to meet everybody again and just. Um, I am in the sports industry, which may be one of the latest to open. Is there any possible consideration to extend wage subsidy and or? So, uh, there, there has been a commitment to, uh, to uh, make $500 million available for the arts, culture and sports. Uh, the, the details of that is yet to be yet to determined. Someone's typing if they could mute themselves, please. I'm going to mute everybody and then I'll unmute. Tony, sorry, I think you were going to speak. Oh no! I, I, uh, uh, I you know, I've, I've been ranting about affordable, scalable, and uh, and reliable broadband. Uh, that continues to be a priority for me, and I think for our business community. I think there's an emerging new industry, though, if I may, on, in, a, in a lighter tone, and that is is uh, torso wardrobes. Uh, the, there, ha there has to be some real opportunities for us there. And then another comment was to answer the question of what other countries have done. Taiwan was the first country to close their borders on December 31st, population 24 million, only six COVID-19 deaths. What can we learn from that? I think, yeah, I'm not sure that's a question that can be answered here. <laughs> um, all right. There's going to be a lot of, of, uh, of review in terms of what, uh, what has been done and what could be done. I think the world Health organization is committed to uh, uh, a review in terms of what has happened uh, and what might be better. Uh, there are there are scientific arguments now that are saying that uh, that uh, isolation isn't necessarily the answer. So, so this is going to, to uh, involve a lot of research and a lot of data and and a lot of uh, 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 discovery, I guess. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us this morning and especially our special guests. Thank you for always being, oh, sorry, somebody has a question. Uh, Dave, Tom. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for setting this up. It was uh, terrific. Thanks for everybody joining. Uh, just a quick question to go back to the rent subsidy program. Um, so my understanding is that, there, that that's a fundamental change uh, for the landlord to work off the gross revenue versus profit. 
Um, will that be confirmed in, in a short period of time? Is there anything else that would be restricting my landlord from uh, uh, working with us on, the, um, on this benefit? So maybe that was the, uh, I'll take that and I'll guess my, uh, maybe my colleague can answer. But yes, that was my understanding is that the, the, that was the stumbling block. That's what we heard is that was, that was the area where that was not, uh, it was uncomfortable for landlords and they didn't want to enter into this. So there weren't, a, there weren't a lot of buying on their part. Once this announcement is made, and from my understanding, it's going to be done uh, fairly quickly. Um, but that should resolve that and uh, there should be a lot more support as a result. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, just a real quick follow-up question. Um, we've already paid for April. <laughs> Is there, how do I deal with that? Is there <clears throat> any uh, opportunity that this might shift to May, June, July? So I, uh, so I, I think uh, maybe Tony will answer this and I'll add something to it afterwards. Go ahead, Tony. Sorry, I cut you off. Actually, I was looking for my reference points here. Um, I'm not aware of whether or not that would be extended. So that might have to become a discussion between you and the landlord, I think, Dave. We can, we can research that and get that and, and uh, let Sandra know, and then maybe you can distribute that, Sandra. Would that be the best way? Sure. And I, I think, I mean, I'm guessing that they could still apply for the loan and then make out an arrangement with the uh, tenant on how they repay the 50% or the 75%. But anyways, we'll look into it and we'll get back to you. All right, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're about 11 minutes over, so I'm going to let everyone go. But thank you very much. This was a very informative session, and I hope everybody felt that they had a chance to have their questions answered. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stay everyone. Safe. Have a good day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.